seat, uh, may I ask uh, the usher to bring in the witness, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. You may proceed, Council. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome back, Professor Sen. Uh, before the short break, uh, we were talking about the background to the 1994 coup d'etat and uh, the factors that led to the coup d'etat. And you discussed the first point, uh, which is the personal factor. The uh, the personal motivations uh, which, which, which led to the coup d'etat. Those are the individual factors. Could you now proceed and tell us about the organizational or institutional factors that you identified in your report? Thank you, Lead Council. Military institutions are very complex. Some would say that's an understatement. But they embody and in so many ways model the larger society in terms of their organizational structure, rank, hierarchy, training, orientation, and a host of other things. In these institutions are also elements of conflict order, disorder, and cleavages, differences in training and rank. These breed competition, conflict, especially as they compete over limited resources. They also vie for prominence vis-a-vis they are civilian counterparts, politicians. So in a sense, in looking at this organizational structure, we want to look at the ways in which the culture itself generates forces, factors, and reasons that in fact may contribute to a coup d'etat. In fact, it is argued that military organizations and institutions do have an ideology that makes them believe that they are the best in developing institutions and countries. I call this the modernizing military view. And we have been pretty much disposed of that idea. I mean, this idea has been quite prevalent, but not as much as it used to be. In some, it is an important place to look at, to assess the causes of the 1994 coup d'etat. Uh, could you take a look at paragraph 20? Which you identified the GNA, as it then was, yes. a fractured institution characterized by cleavages based on rank, ethnicity, salary, and other material differences. And you also identified the problems with regards between the junior officers and the Nigerian senior and Gambian senior officers. You identified this. You suggested that in well or in highly trained uh, professional armies, 
these issues you identify would be factors that would be a source of discipline and order and stability uh, as opposed to what happened in the Gambia National Army. Yes. Could you further uh, elucidate on that? Military institutions are very structured. There's hierarchy, there's order, there's discipline for the most part. And the hierarchy makes it possible to maintain discipline as a result. Procedures are very much defined, very well defined. And there's a chain of command which makes it possible to resolve conflict between and within ranks. There's a chain of order. Now, in the face of poor training, limited resources, and cleavages based on ethnicity, sometimes class and religion, exacerbated by economic differentiation, and against the backdrop of societal problems, the military then becomes a major player within the political process. What I'm basically suggesting is these elements that I identified make it a fertile ground for the occurrence of coup d'etat. Ambitious young men, in this case, were affected by those limitations within the army. Uh, you also identified the divide, mm -hmm. uh, or rather the divided loyalties mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, the political divisions and the ethnic divisions within the army at yes. the time. How did this mix uh, contribute to, to the organizational factor? In many, many important ways, it is argued that those in the top brass of the military, because of their rank, their class orientation, in many ways had similar interests with their civilian political counterparts. And it went all the way down, so that those at the bottom, the rank and file, had less in common economically and had a less sympathetic orientation, political orientation, to the elite. What that basically suggests is a deep political divide so that the divisions in the army replicated the divisions in society. It is said by some witnesses that the officer core in the army uh, was a reflection of what you have just said, those political divisions yes. in our society. Cronism, the Banjul Mafia, yes. the Terry Kafo, yes. the Bakari Dabok group, and the Sehu Savali group, all represented in the army vying for control and authority. Yes. Does that reflect, uh, is it a reflection of the findings that you have made in your studies? Or yes, something? yes. And not only mine. I mean, there have been others too that have come to similar conclusions. Uh, John Weissman, Elizabeth Widler, Ibrahim Sise, and many others have come to similar conclusions. And this is not only true of the Gambia. When you look at Kuretas in the former Zaire and Ghana, uh, ethnicity and the replication of the conflicts in society in the army itself became quite important. Uh, what impact did this have on civilian control or civilian security for the army? Well, it really didn't have a positive impact or effect 
In fact, many military regimes or armies in West Africa, and possibly throughout much of the third world, do not subscribe to the notion or principle of civilian supremacy. In fact, they believe they do better than the civilians when it comes to running these countries and consequently decide to intervene. Uh, in your report in paragraph 23, you put it thus, Yet the general belief amongst most military organizations in Africa at the time was the army was justified to intervene because of its putative professional qualities of efficiency and professionalism. Yes. In fact, many scholars of modernization theory, including Huntington, argued the army was most suited to modernizing a country rather than civilians. I term this the modernizing military view. Was that also a view held by Gambian soldiers? You think? I believe so. And I think it was also a view held by many Gambians in the population. So, um, in paragraph 24, uh, the conclusion you have on this particular issue is quite interesting. Could you kindly read it out, paragraph 24? 24. Page 11. Okay. To the contrary, the GNA was for all intents and purposes dysfunctional and lacked the discipline to carry out its national mandate of protecting the nation. In fact, it became complicit and imported to the rivalries and factionalism that was rife in society. Jame and his coup conspirators, aware of these anomalies in the GNA, believed a coup could be successfully executed. Thus, a combination of personal grievances, political ambition, and greed, alongside organizational institutional failures were important contributory factors in the 1994 coup d'etat. Good. So now we can move on to the societal and environmental factors that you identified. Uh, let's discuss now the societal okay. and environmental factors you identified. Yes. One of the important things in looking at the 1994 coup, as in coups in other parts of the world, is to look at society as an entity. How is society organized? What are the important groups? How is prestige and how are more important the resources distributed? Who gets what and who doesn't and why? What are the class divisions, the ethnic, racial in some cases, religious, in fact regional differences too? All this come to play when coup d'etats are analyzed at the environmental societal level. What is also clear at this level of analysis is the fact that these societies are in transition for the most part and over time breed deprivation, discontent that in fact are very important in contributing to coup d'etats within those societies. So it is an important level to look at as it lens or provides another lens through which to analyze coup d'etats. Uh, you mentioned certain groups in your report yes. as a reflection of some of these problems you identified. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned the Kent Street Zoo, for instance, and the Jerry Cafo. Uh, what is the what is the role played by groups of this nature uh, in this important debate? They played a very important role in so far as they were sometimes hotbeds of contention. Many of them were young intellectuals, maybe at the sixth form, some had just graduated from university. Others were in the civil service. They were part of the evolving elite. They provided the ideological fodder for discussion. Some of them had been trained in African universities, others in Western universities. So they came back with a lot of ideas about change. They were disgruntled for some of them about the pace of change and development in the country. They were also imbued by ideas of Pan-Africanism. You remember Stokely Carmichael and many others did visit the country, among others. Um, the ideas of Nkrumah also played a major role in sensitizing and raising the political awareness of Gambians during that time. What I'm saying is, it created a very fertile ground for discussion as well as questioning the very basis of political legitimacy of the government in place. And over time, I think, their ideas began to have effect and permeated much of society, influencing the young ones as well. Thank you, thank you. Take a look at paragraph 28 of the report. Perhaps maybe we should read it out. Okay. By the time of the 1994 coup d'etat, Gambia had transformed into a deeply divided social and economic formation. And it also became apparent that the PPP and Jawara overstayed their welcome in power, which added another critical dimension to the growing expectation that elections alone could not and would not dislodge the government. And in 1992 presidential elections made this perception all the more evident and was used as fodder to fool this widely shared sentiment. And as noted earlier, charges of endemic corruption, inflated travel reports, and per diems increased popular discontent and distrust in government and resulted in declining legitimacy for the government and the PPP itself internal factionalism and growing distrust among its members, especially after Jawara announced, Jawara's announcement and failure to select a successor at Mansa Kanka, nursed perceptions of a power vacuum with growing expectation that the army needed to step in and avert further decline of the economy and the politic. In sum, these societal, environmental factors greatly contributed to the coup d'etat. Uh, you also went on to identify sub-regional factors. Yes. Could you take us through them very quickly? Yes. The 80s were very turbulent times. The entire subcontinent, and especially the West African subregion, was engulfed in conflict. Be it in Liberia, Sierra Leone, many of the countries were also led by military regimes. So when it came to democracy and democratization, there was a very significant deficit. 
except for the Gambia, where there was some semblance of democracy and stability. And Gambia was very much invested, and Sadawda was, in restoring peace and order in this very volatile sub-region. Gambians served in Liberia, Ekomok, Ekomik, among others. But this was to have a contagion effect, I suggest. By that I mean the instability that engulfed Gambia began to have a knock-on effect, began to seep in to the country itself. And over time, that too contributed to the coup d'etat of 1994. I don't believe this is the most important factor some would say this is the dependent variable, but it nonetheless contributed in some degree to the coup because Sadada became increasingly more invested in resolving the conflicts in the subcontinent. How about the service by Gambian forces uh, in Liberia? as part of the ECOMO yes. troops yes. to help uh, deal with the peace and security threat problems in Liberia. How did that affect Gambia? It affected Gambia insofar as many of them coming back. And the failure of government to pay them their salaries or their per diems created frustration leading to several demonstrations against the government at State House. Many of them also felt that the government was not very receptive to their demands. I believe over time this was to create deep resentment against the government. And these combined with societal factors, internal military conditions, personal ambition, all culminating to cause the coup d'etat. And uh, how about um, the effect of the wars that were being fought in Liberia and Sierra Leone at the time, and their effect on Gambia, by, for instance, the mm -hmm. influx of refugees and yes. so forth. Has that had any effect on, on the situation? Gambia being a very small country and an economy that was teetering on collapse was further burdened by the influx of these refugees. While there was some international help, I don't believe it went far enough in uh, curbing the problem. And it created some kind of societal uh, instability. Uh, the refugees could not be easily absorbed and uh, economic resources, as a result, were severely strained. And I think this also added to the perception that the government wasn't doing enough. And I think this also contributed indirectly uh, to the coup d'etat. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll now move on to the second pre-assigned question, uh, which is, um, what were the circumstances and factors that enabled the gradual erosion of human rights and democratic norms, and ultimately led to the creation, consolidation, and sustenance of the German dictatorial regime? And you have that addressed in page 14 yes. of the report onwards. Yes. Jame and his cohort, the FPRC, engineered the process, the electoral process, in such a way as to make it favorable to themselves. They created an independent electoral commission that they appointed themselves or Jan appointed themselves. 
and after that a constitution was quickly drafted and passed with very favorable terms for Jami himself the age limit the term limits were all expunged from the constitution in addition to that uh, decree 45 gave Jame and the AFPRC the right to seize, arrest, detain, interrogate individuals who were suspected or perceived to be enemies of the regime. In addition, Decrees 70 and 71 were intended primarily to muzzle the press. So a combination of legal means, formal legal means, were utilized by the regime in an effort to perpetuate itself. And I can go on and give more examples. Banning of political parties. All the major political parties were banned, except for Doi and the newly emerging UDP. Um, the death sentence was restored. And Jami was to use this in the future uh, to execute 12, 12 Gambians, well, including some Senegalese. In a sense, you are saying uh, that uh, primarily Jami used the constitution to engineer uh, perpetuating himself in power. Yes. Uh, first, by removing the age limit. Uh, that would have barred him from contesting president. Yes. And removing the term limits, that would have limited the number of times he served as president. Uh, and he used other means as well. You mentioned DP 45 and so forth. Yes. But in fact, the Constitution went through fundamental changes over the years, in fact, 52 amendments uh, during that short period of time, many of them seem to have been aimed at strengthening his authority. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Uh, there is this provision which enables Jame to dismiss judges for the first time yes. in Gambia's constitution. There is also the provision which enables him to do business yes. for the first time. Uh, all that helped in, in giving him more power. Yes. To Even the fact that elections, I mean the 50 plus one, was also expunged, which came in the end to bite him. I wouldn't mention where, but <laughs> uh, cost him quite a bit of angst. Uh, the commission looked at the muscling of the press and uh, we learned that more than 140 arrests were made of journalists and uh, media houses were attacked. Yes. Uh, would you say that it's a correct conclusion to say that muscling of the media and attacking journalists also helped in, in uh, creating a dictatorship for Jami because Absolutely. I think this was a very calculated effort on the part of Jami and the AFPRC to ensure that there was no dissent or expression that would undermine their grip on power. How about the banning of political leaders? What was the effect of that? Well, it eliminated practically all the competition. When you banned the PPP and the other major parties and politicians, you virtually leave yourself alone. I mean, the playing field uh, becomes very uneven. And in addition to charging candidates to pay, I believe at the time, $1,000, it was about $10,000. That was a lot of money at that time. And few could afford that. 
Uh, I think you also needed signatures, about 5,000, among other things. I wrote this about 25 years ago, so I'm still fuzzy on the numbers. But yes, these were just calculated efforts to basically limit competition. And for the first election, uh, the campaign period, is there anything to be learned from that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 it was shortened. One was, week? I think it was about a week. We can have, at most, two. It was truncated to the point where only Jame uh, could benefit. But in the meantime, he had the Midi Farmers Tour, which he went around the country uh, and basically canvassing for so, but that aside, he created the NIA. What effect did that have? A culture of silence in some was, was, was created. They arrested, they tortured, they killed, they disappeared, you name it, in an effort to, to ensure little, if any, resistance from the population. Meanwhile, uh, the press remained muzzled. People disappeared, some killed, tortured, uh, printing houses set a fire. So really, it was very calculated. He knew basically what he was doing. He learned well from Ghana, from Jerry Robbins. And come November 11 to test his power, what happened and what impact did that have? November 11 is an infamy. It was orchestrated primarily to eliminate the perceived enemies of Jammeh and the FPRC. It was a cult of enemies within where? Within the military, within the army. And I think it was, an, it was a very calculated effort to, to send a very strong message to anybody who dared challenge his rule. And the consequences were disastrous. The evidence received from Sanasai, Bayro Sabali, and others is that um, the ringleaders of November 11 were executed, including people, officers from very close to where you hump, where you hail from, yes. Balangar boys. Well, I'm from Balangar too. Yes. Uh, Abdullah Dotfal, Tafanyang, yes. and yes. others. Yes. What was the impact of that? devastating nationally and within the military itself. Uh, I think it broke, took away the innocence of Gambians. Never in the history of this country did we ever witness such wanton slaughter of individuals in the military. In other words, we were dispossessed. We were disabused of our innocence. But that would not be the end of the killings in order to maintain his grip in power. Uh, in paragraph 39 of your report, you talk about uh, groups that Jame put in place to eliminate opposition. Could you discuss more about that? Well, in addition to the legal formal means of maintaining power and the use of brutal force, Jame also had clandestine groups that engaged in, in atrocious acts of violence against citizens. The Green Boys, 
the junglers, uh, black black, just to name a few, did just that. It was extrajudicial killings, something separate and apart from what the NIA would typically do. Examples? Of the killings? Uh, yes, of the activities of those groups you mentioned, Green Boys, Black Black, yes. Douglas. Well, the assassination of um, Beta Hydera, the disappearance of Chief Mani, amongst others. For the Makalo, um, I'm not really sure what ever happened to For the Makalo. It is said he died in Mali. Some say he was executed. Uh, it's still unclear to me. Clear case of enforced disappearance. Yes. yes. But we've heard the jungle has testified about the killings of a lot more people, mm -hmm. uh, ostensibly under the direction or ordering of Jan. So, in a sense, you're telling us that the violence and intimidation served as the foundation and subsequent consolidation of the Jame regime. Yes. You yes. maintain that conclusion. Yes. Uh, but uh, he also used other institutions of state. Uh, I'm referring specifically to paragraph 40 of your report. Yes. Uh, the judicial branch and the, the bar and uh, other institutions. Could you tell us about that? The contention I make in this paragraph is that in addition to the things we already mentioned, Jame also used judges. He used the courts. He used Nigerian mercenary judges in particular to render verdicts that were favorable to him or his position many Gambians were put away on trumped up charges, especially if they were perceived to be threats to the regime and Jami himself. He used Gambians, legal luminaries, to craft the laws and the decrees that enabled him therefore to remain in power and do just that. He fired people, he hired and fired judges. Very uncommon in other parts of the world. The hiring and firing, uh, what effect did that have, if you could tell? I think it really put into question the fairness of the judicial system. It dismantled the infrastructure of the judicial system, more importantly. And over time, people really lost confidence. It was predictable what lay ahead of all victims or those who were accused or charged of crimes that many times were made up. But what was the impact of the hiring and firing on the people who were hired and fired, the civil servants themselves? Well, it created what I learned from you the other day, the Stockholm Syndrome, which is basically a psychological image in which those you victimize the most turn around to do your own bidding and come to come to love you even despite those atrocities. Well, we have heard of a number of people yes. who are imprisoned by Yame, tortured by his, uh, by his subordinates or, or his, uh, his men mm -hmm. 
who later on turn out to be Jamaica's biggest defenders. Uh, and uh, that pretty much sums up what the Stockholm Syndrome is. Yeah. Uh, and that may not be unusual, early uh, counsel. You, you find that that was also prevalent during the Nazi extermination of Jews in the concentration camps. It is not also unusual to find so-called terrorist groups and their captives um, falling in love or being endeared to, to their captives. Uh, well, we have heard that um, a person called Rambo Jata was arrested and detained in several police stations around the country for over a period of a year and may have even been tortured. Yes. Uh, how would you describe his loyalty to Yam? Along the same lines, I don't know him personally, but I have read and heard a lot about him. And I think he is a manifestation of that pathological, deeply troubled syndrome. It's a disease of the mind. Yes. Um, you, apart from some who suffered with Stockholm syndrome, you also had civil servants who pretty much gave blind loyalty, even though they may have been sacked from their jobs and reinstated several times. We've heard of those who, who had nine lives because they may have been sacked so many times people lose count the number of times they've been sacked and reinstated. What do you say about that? Well, Jamin knew pretty much the psychology and the mentality of the Gambian elite. He loved them and he despised them at the same time. He used them and abused them. He misused them too. And his, his primary intention was to maintain his power at whatever cost. So people were fired, rehired, and then silenced. And once you were silenced, whatever you might have said about him in the past would, would be ignored. And before long, uh, you were part of the cabal, so to speak. You became a beneficiary to the so-called uh, perks within the regime. He understood very well the greed, uh, the competition that informed the elite group. Our society is one predicated on, on excellence, show me, show me, very externally oriented in our cultural uh, manifestations. So Jami understood this very well. And he used this craftily to sideline, to disgrace, to silence, all in an effort to keep himself in power. How about the professional association, such as the Bar Association? Can you tell us about that? The Bell Association is an important group in this country and have been for a very long time. They played important roles in the pre-independence period and thereafter. Lawyers were very important in the quest for independence in Gambia. And during the first 10 years of independence, were instrumental in maintaining law and order. Gambia was respected for its judicial liberal temperament. And this continued for a long time. Under Jami, on the other hand, 
the bar association gradually became silenced some of its members were co-opted into writing the decrees and over time became complicit in the very violation of fundamental human rights so in time they lost the respectability that they once enjoyed and uh, in paragraph 40 you stated towards the tail end mm. uh, that there was ultimately a polarized and deeply politicized bar association yes. that was recreated as part of Jammeh's diabolical strategy of divide and conquer policy. Yes, absolutely. In fact, some do say that there were basically two bar associations, mm -hmm. uh, one run by a Nigerian chief justice and one run by the disaffected. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I wasn't here to know, but <laughs> such is the story. Yes. Uh, does your research uh, reflect that? I believe so. Even though the, the Jamia loyalists were more dominant and they clearly uh, served them well, and in doing so, the service to the Gambian population. You went on to say, uh, in the same paragraph 40, last line of page 16, various Nigerian chief justices followed suit and became effective tools of Jamaica. Yet, co-optation and inducement were not limited to the legal professionals, but were also extended to senior civil servants who served Jame in various cabinet-level positions that included Gambia's best and brightest. Yes. Absolutely. It became very disconcerting to see well-respected Gambians in the senior civil service bracket being toyed with by Jami, who for all intents and purposes used them, abused them for his own ends. Refused them to and refused them to hear. You, your explanation it's not even limited to just the violence that was perpetrated, the use of the law to entrench himself in power. We went on to discuss uh, the use of cultural and social infrastructure to cement or sustain this regime. Can you expand on that? That is a very interesting question. Other than the formal legal means that Jami used, he understood the personality and the culture and the operational code of Gambians. We are predominantly a very religious, in quote, people. But we also double in other traditions that include the occult. There is also a hierarchy in our societies built around superstition. And belief in the jinn or devils and so forth and so on. He appropriated these effectively to consolidate power. He also was able to convince a lot of people that he knew more than he did. He had powers beyond the normal. He had paranormal powers, which many people believe. This is part of the, the building block of Gambian culture. 
I think he did. I think he was using religion effectively as many other politicians have in the past. To curry favor on one hand from those who are Muslim in this country and at the same time consolidating his rule. So in other words religion became another tool in the hands of Jami to consolidate, gain support from the clergy and imams so as to, or some imams, some clergy, let me qualify that, in an effort to keep himself in power. How about the use of religious symbols yes. and paraphernalia, oh, yes. carrying the Quran yes. and, the, and the sword? Did that have any effect? I think it did to some people, yes. But it was, for me, personally, very distasteful. It embodied a personality that for all intents and purposes knew little of the Quran, maybe in fact doubled in things that were anti-religious. He was said to partake of alcohol and other forbidden foods and engage in activities that were unreligious, un-Islamic, and so forth. It was a tool, in, in, in other words. Paragraph 42 is quite interesting. Okay. What you have here, could you read it Can out? Can I read that? Okay. <laughs> Thus, religious leaders and marabouts, sometimes one and the same, wielded considerable power over the aspects of society. In doing so, they not only serve as intermediaries and intercede on behalf of and between humans and God, but they also help legitimize those in power. The belief that a leader is sanctioned and installed by God is a belief commonly shared by all the subtexts of which is one does not challenge leaders installed by God because when you do you challenge God. Culturally the world of saying which has parallels in other Gambian languages is that a stone does not rustle with an egg which basically means in all of Dutch Duborek, Nen Duborek Dutch. Dutch Duborek Nen, yes, sorry. Should I continue? Okay. Yes, please. They implore citizens to obey, not challenge its status quo, even under brutal conditions. The refrain is to leave it to God. Most Gambians internalize these cultural and religious beliefs. And by the time they are 10 years old. Traditional healers also play a vital role in addressing the spiritual as well as the medical needs of traditional believers, Muslims and Christians alike. Uh, uh, yes, you raised this, uh, uh, this um how would I call it? Is it this wall of saying? Uh, Auntie Adelaide corrected it by saying it's Nen Dubore at Dutch. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I converted it. Thank you. Yes. So, so, so that correction has to, Nen has, Dubore Dutch, yes. has to be made. Yes. Uh, but Jamis uh, used religion effectively from what you have said. 
we have seen images of, of Jame throwing water and uh, we hear that some of our more respected imams would call it to, to touch some of that mm. water mm. And, uh, and rub it all over their bodies. Did your researches reflect anything like that? And what would that mean uh, for Gambian society? How, yeah. What lessons do we draw from? Well, I've, I've not heard of that particular instance, but the symbolism in itself is very telling. I think what it shows basically is the kind of control and power he was able to wield over the marabouts and the and the clergy and the imams and so forth and so on. Uh, if if they have to go so low and revere Jami, who for all we know knew little about the Quran or the Bible, to me really talks about the low depths or the psychophancy of some, not all of them, because we had the Imam Fofanas and the others, uh, Imam Babali, who stood up to Jami. For those that did not, and did as you suggest, uh, I think it's, it's very troubling to say the least. But he also created a persona mm -hmm. of a person with supernatural power. Yes. Could you talk about that? Well, I've been I've been told that he he in fact could conjure powers. He could see through people. He could consult with the Jalangs and he could freeze you, he could just do practically anything he wanted to do because of this magical and supernatural powers. And I think he was able to convince a lot of people, especially for those patients who had HIV AIDS, which led to disastrous consequences. In fact, there's a story about him trying to um, tame the bees on a tree that basically scattered and, and, and basically stung him uh, quite, uh, quite severely. The bees stung him when he was trying to tame them? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And the fertility treatment? And the what? Fertility treatment? Yes, the fertility treatments. Um, it's surprising he had only two. Two children, yes. <laughs> That's the irony, isn't it? But he was said to have had many, many lovers and raped a lot of women. We, we had that every yes. Uh, um, all this, all this, as you said, created this image. <coughs> which in the end uh, led to a dictatorship. Um, paragraphs 45 and 46, actually through 47 of your report, mm. is quite interesting. Yes. Can you kind of read it up? Okay. Paragraph 45. In time, Jame misused his alleged healing skills to engage in wild sexual escapades with young women. He taunted Gambian men to surrender their wives to him if they needed proof of the efficacy of his concoctions. At another level, Jami made these utterances to divide, a, to drive a political wedge between husbands and wives and between women and men more generally, given that women were an important constituency in his many electoral victories. Together with religious leaders whom he courted and won with generous gifts, 
his putative acts of piety and threats added significantly to Jammeh's political longevity and consolidation. Many would go to the extent that he was installed by Allah and whoever opposed Jammeh opposed Allah. Resistance and self-determination, though permissible in Islam, we are downplayed by him and imams in favor of a more conformist and docile political response. Thus, among most Gambians, only Allah could ask Jame, and when he lost the 2016 presidential elections, most attributed it to the will of God, not to the Gambian electorate. The Imam Ratib of Banjo, Imam Sheikh Chanuka was at his back on call. He in particular blessed Jame at state functions, prayed for his fame during Friday sermons, and visited State House to share in Jame's loot of Gambia's meager resources. These prayers notwithstanding could not avert Jame's fall from us. In some, a cultural infrastructure informed and reinforced by religious beliefs in a country of professed Muslims and Christians helped support Jami and sustain his role. This cultural infrastructure was likewise used by Jami to rationalize his draconian rule and abuse of human rights specifically. Ultimately, a combination of military decrees, use and misuse of judiciary, the repressive arm of the state, alongside a cultural and ideological superstructure, helped maintain Jame in power. And for 22 years. And for 22 years, yes. We said, yeah, perhaps this is a time to stop for it. Thank you. The, uh, testimony of the witness is so illuminating. I think we, have, we probably can skip lunch and then go on. <laughs> he would rather not. <laughs> he would need his well. <laughs> well. He wasn't running around the kitchen and the dining hall in Amity. I was going to say, <laughs> he used to punish me. <laughs> but we'll take I'll, a, I'll say something about that, Lamy later. No? <laughs> No, be careful about that. It still can punish. <laughs> but uh, thank you again so much, um, uh, um, uh, Professor Sen. And uh, we will take a one-hour break and come back and help us too. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.